It's Friday afternoon, Thursday afternoon, post lunch, and I'm going to be talking about a uh, little bit about my cancer journey. So maybe it's only appropriate that I have the graveyard shift. <clears throat> I think all of you have had a nice lunch, and some of you. Some of you might be feeling like that. If you do, I have only one request of you. Please don't snore too loudly, because you might wake up the person next to you. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> well, I'm here today to do three things. First, I would like to share my journey. Second, I want to pose some leadership reflections. Because my journey may be fine by itself, but all of you are leaders. And I want to see what connections we can make between some of the insights that I have in my journey and your leadership. So as I present, I will be asking you to reflect and make some notes. So I'm going to invite everyone who hasn't taken out those beautiful eclipse pads from their bags, <laughs> and I'm sure there are some of you, I invite you to please take them out, keep a pen handy, because you're going to need it. OK, can I request that, please? Thank you. <clears throat> and then if we have some time, at the end of my session, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions in the big group, over tea, after the program, whatever. Now, today I'm standing here by myself, speaking to you. But this journey, this 13-year journey, has been taken step by step with me by my beloved wife, Nilima, who isn't here today. So in a way, I'm representing both of us and not just me. This is my way of hiding behind her if I say something silly. Okay? I also realize that I'm sandwiched between two amazing scientists. And I just want to tell you and confess that I'm not a scientist. I'm not a researcher. I'm not a clinician. What I am is a human being who's experienced cancer. And I, therefore, want to focus not so much on the science and the research. I will mention it. But I want to focus on the human experience and what lessons we can learn from it that might be applied to leadership. <clears throat> this sounds like a brave and inspiring story, but let me assure you that it was not. <clears throat> When I first heard about my cancer diagnosis, it was a cold and dark December day in London, 2001. And the doctor brought me out of uh, sedation after an endoscopy and said, I'm very sorry to tell you, but you have cancer. And at that moment, the first thought that went through my head was, that's it, I'm going to die. And I discovered very soon after that I might have had a fantastic career in the advertising business. I might have been a reasonably good husband. I know I was a pretty good father. But in that moment, I discovered that I was not a hero. I was a coward. And the same thing happened to me that happens to everybody who gets a cancer diagnosis. It punches a hole through your sense of self. And so I asked myself that <clears throat> typical questions. What's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to the children? How are things going to be? And somewhere, this question of why me? 
came up. It's a very common question. <coughs> Why me? <coughs> I want to tell you a story that I found very inspiring. It's about the famous tennis player Arthur Ashe. Uh, as you know, he died of HIV AIDS. And uh, in his last days, he was being interviewed by a TV channel, I think, and somebody asked him, Mr. Ash, you've achieved so much, and now you're in this situation. Have you asked yourself the question, why me, and what was your answer? And what Arthur Ash said is that, look, I've won Wimbledon. I've won many big tournaments. I've stood up there, I've held up these trophies, I've kissed these trophies, I've given autographs, I've been in press conferences, at that time, I did not ask the question, why me? How can you expect me to ask this question now? Why not me? He said. And so I realized, many years later, of course, that this why me question actually puts us into a very tight corner. And underneath that why me question, <coughs> Oops. There are three fears. And since I'm an expert on cowardice, I can tell you what these three fears were for me at least. The first fear is the fear of death. It's a very existential biological fear. The second is the fear of loss the loss of a future, the loss of life as I would like it to be. And the third is the fear of uncertainty. I have no idea what's going to happen in the future. Until then, I had a reasonable idea of what was going to happen in the future. So in a way, the rug gets pulled out from under your feet. And you're left in this very strange kind of place. <clears throat> and because I was so disoriented, so scared, so desperate to regain some sense of semblance, some semblance of normalcy, of equilibrium, I did what most people do. I externalized my illness. I quickly jumped to the conclusion that the illness had come from outside in some way. And how was I to know any different? All my previous illnesses had come from outside. Bacteria, toxins, viruses, all this stuff. I had no idea at that time that I would discover that cancer is something different. <clears throat> so, the first leadership reflection for you to think about. When an unexpected crisis hits you, what are you most afraid of? It could be a business crisis, it could be a health crisis, it could be a financial crisis. Whatever that crisis is, just take a few seconds, 30 seconds, and I really want you to write down in that book, when a serious unexpected crisis hits you, what are you most afraid of? So as you can see, I was serious about taking you along in the journey, okay? So please think about this. What are you most afraid of? <clears throat> I'm aware that all the blood in your body has rushed for digestion and that you may have to do a little bit of kapal bhati or breathing to bring the blood up to the brain again. Hopefully these reflections will help you to do that. <clears throat> uh, 
Two days after my diagnosis, I did something very counterintuitive to me. <clears throat> Most people, when they have a cancer diagnosis, they turn inwards. They withdraw. They go into a shell. For some reason that I can really not explain, even today, I did the exact opposite. I wrote an email to about 500 of my family, friends, colleagues, associates around the world, a long email titled, A New Mountain to Climb, and I told them exactly what was going on. I felt good about that because I was living in London, far away from home, which is India. And to my amazement and delight, all of them responded. And they responded with so much love, so much support, so many ideas, so many resources, that I was just, poof, saying, wow. I didn't even know that I had so much goodwill in the world. And so, <clears throat> One of my really early and important lessons is that relationships are the forgotten factor in healing. Love matters. Love is the only thing that illuminates the dark night of the soul. So when people today ask me, should I be talking about it and so on, I say yes, go for it. If you feel the need to share, go for it. And the universe, in the shape of all your well-wishers, will respond. So I'm very grateful to all those people because they stormed heaven on my behalf. I was in no condition to storm heaven, but they did. Means a lot to me. Now this has become a ritual. Then every month, every three months, every six months, every year, I would write an update and it is poured in. And it's a file that's about this thick. It's one of my most cherished possessions. It's my Storming Heaven file. <clears throat> so the second reflection for you, as leaders, when you're in a tight spot, how and when do you reach out for help? And perhaps a more difficult question, what blocks you from being vulnerable? When you're in a tight spot, how soon, when do you reach out for help? And what blocks you from being vulnerable? What's your first instinct? I know what my first instinct was. And when I reflect back, this was really crucial for me even in my leadership role. I realized that I had been very successful, but it had very little to do with just me. In the company that I worked for, which is a multinational company called Ogilvy and Mather, one of the unusual things about the Ogilvy culture, very strong culture, is you get brownie points for asking for help. You get minus marks if you don't ask for help. And perhaps this had been ingrained in me for all those years, so I just reached out and asked for help when I needed it most. Surgery happened, surgery was successful. Took me a few weeks to kind of start getting back to my feet because you know, colon cancer, big surgical cut. And in the process, as people started interacting with me and a few weeks later the doctor said, come on, I think you're doing really well, your recovery is fantastic, you can start going to work for an hour or two. And so I did. I started going to work. 
Everybody was warm and welcoming and supportive, but I felt strange. I really felt strange for two reasons. One, when I was in the hospital, the doctors, you know, this is called a tumor board. For those of you who know, they would have a conversation and sometimes they probably assumed that I was sedated or not paying attention or couldn't understand English or something, I don't know. But they would refer to me based on my cancer classification. Oh, CA colon T3N0M0, subtotal colectomy, iliorectal anastomosis, what do you think? How's he doing? And so I had this feeling as if the real me had disappeared, gone somewhere, behind the gowns and the medicines and the technology and all that stuff. And then I went back to work. Something had changed inside for me from that experience. And I did not feel like the person I was. I did not know who I was becoming but I did not know who I was. And it struck me that, do you know the story of Rip Van Winkle, who fell asleep for 20 years and woke up to a reality that he could not recognize and the others could not recognize him? So this is Rip Van Vijay. There was a sense of disconnection and disorientation from what was going on. And the same company that I worked for, that I'd worked for for then almost 18 years, I started to feel as if it was strange and I was really not part of this anymore. And I really had to work at answering this question, who am I? And I had good help at that time. So one of the people who was helping me, <clears throat> he played this little game with me and he said, okay, so who are you? I'd say, okay, I'm Vijay Bhatt. And so the person would say, okay, if you went underneath the name, if the name was taken away, who are you? And then I would say, well, I'm the global whatever category director for Ogilvy and Mehta. Okay, if the title is taken away, who are you? And then I would say, hmm, I'm the husband to Nilima. Okay, if that husband role were taken away, who are you? And he kept doing this. And I really had to struggle and find out and say, who am I? And there were no answers forthcoming at that point in time. So in a way, this became my quest to say, who am I? And this quest continued for many years. <clears throat> My Cancer is Me is the title of our book. And I realized going through this process that it's very easy to be a victim. It's very easy to blame the external environment. It's very easy to blame one's circumstances. But when I started reading about people who had survived and done well from cancer, I started to see that these were people who alongside their medical treatments were also working on themselves. And it seemed to me that the more they worked on themselves, the better their results were. And so I started to have this sense that, you know, Maybe my cancer is not just about some tumor in my colon. Maybe it's pointing to something bigger and deeper. It's pointing to me. And slowly this theory started forming in my head, which we finally brought down to these four words. But that cancer is a disease of our cells. It arises from within us because a cell goes haywire. Nobody really knows why that happens. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But I started to see that externalizing the illness would limit my healing. And that I've truly wanted to heal. 
if I truly wanted to heal, then I needed to take some responsibility for what had happened. It was really tough getting to that place, I promise you. But it was the turning point. It shifted my perspective because the person or the, the thing that I had most influence and control over is me. So I could do something about me. This is a very important uh, perspective and insight according to us. The process, that time our kids were young and uh, my son was an absolute master at Lego. Okay? And he could put things, pull things apart and put them back together again like magic. And I realized that for the first three to six months of my journey, that was pretty much what I was doing to myself. I had good help. I wasn't doing it alone. But essentially, the process was about deconstructing and then reconstructing. Now here's the interesting thing. Who is doing the deconstructing of whom? I'm doing the deconstruction of myself. So in other words, there is me, Vijay, and there is this thing that is getting deconstructed. And then there is me, and there is this thing that is getting reconstructed. So I started to see that there is another part of me which is slightly removed from all this chaos that's going on. And really for the first time I started to get in touch with a deeper part of myself that was really unaffected by all this stuff. This was in a way for me the early doors of spirituality opening. I started to sense that, oh, this is what's actually going on here. <clears throat> and because of this distancing, and because of this process of deconstruction and reconstruction, I started to see that cancer, any other major life-threatening illness, or any other big traumatic event can perhaps become an opportunity for self-transcendence. What does that mean? What does self-transcendence mean? It means to, let's assume this is our normal level, right? And you have a traumatic event and your equilibrium goes down to minus five. And you can work, work, work and bring it back to this normal level but I don't think that is self-transcendence. That is just a return to normalcy. Self-transcendence means going to plus five. Rising beyond what I was before. So the old self had to be transcended. This is tough because we are asking that you set a very high goal for yourself when you're in an extremely vulnerable place. But I think it's worth doing because, in my opinion, cancer made me a better person than I used to be. I don't think I would be what I am today if I had not been through the cancer experience. As they say, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. So I can say for myself, I'm speaking for myself, cancer made me stronger. So here's the interesting thing, that the trauma itself becomes a mirror. The trauma becomes the mirror in which you can start to see your blind spots. You can, see start, you can start to see yourself in a way that you've never seen before, if you care to look. 
And then if you care to stick with that process, then the trauma itself also becomes a springboard for your future growth. I was talking with a few people at lunch and they were talking about how Malaysia took the opportunity of the 1997 crisis to reform many things about the financial setup within Malaysia. And that has stood the country in good stead. It was a traumatic event. But perhaps other opportunities were not taken fully and some, some of those jobs remain unfinished. So in exactly the same way, the trauma itself becomes a mirror to show you here are some gaps, here are some things to work on, and then if you stick with it, it springs you forward. The trouble is we run away from the trauma. We don't go towards it, we withdraw from it. That was my big learning. So reflection number three for you, adversity. Professional, personal, family, social. What does it reveal about your true character? And for me, the more important question how have you grown from it? I promise you, every one of you has faced adversity, for sure. Think of the most extreme adversity you have faced. And think about what did it reveal, not to anybody else, but to you, of your true character, and how did you grow from it? Take a bit of time. So here's the interesting thing. I like to say that cancer healed me. I think you will start to notice that my relationship with cancer was changing rapidly. How many of you have seen the movie The Life of Pi? Who's Richard Parker? Was he really a tiger? Probably not. And how did Pi's relationship with Richard Parker change over the book and over the movie? It was a hostile relationship to begin with. Fierce survival against this predator. And then over a period of time, a kind of relationship, closeness, interdependence develops. And then at the end, when they are both completely drained and dying, starving, Pai has to lay that great tiger's head on his lap and say, Richard Parker, I love you. And then at the end, he can let it go. So my relationship with cancer started to take the same, the same perspective. And therefore, I today can say that cancer healed me. Many people like to use words like, how did you cure yourself of cancer? I'm not sure that I could say that honestly about myself. This I can say honestly about myself. Cancer healed me. And so one of the crucial things in this was the act of taking responsibility, as I mentioned. 
what is responsibility? It's not about blaming myself or anything else. It's not about being a victim. Actually, it's about making choices with awareness. Responsibility is about making choices with awareness. And responsibility is about being willing to take every outcome of the choices we make. So for example, <clears throat> because my surgery was successful, I was given the choice by the doctors in the UK I could decide whether I should take chemotherapy or not. And they gave me the statistics and they said, look, if you take chemotherapy, your chance of recurrence is 28%. If you don't take chemotherapy, your chance of recurrence is 30%. 2% difference. So for me, it was pretty straightforward. I'm not going to put my body through the horrors of chemotherapy for that 2%. But having made that decision, now I was responsible for minimizing that 28% and bringing it to zero, isn't it? Because as far as the doctors are concerned, I made the decision. So therefore, Nilima and I dived into the whole holistic and integrated approaches to say, what else could we do? What else could we do to minimize the chances of recurrence? I cannot tell you how many diets I've tried. I cannot tell you how many herbal drinks I've consumed. I cannot tell you how many counselors I've met. I cannot tell you how many energy healing, Reiki, light healing, sound healing, every conceivable type of healing I've tried. And the reason why I had to do that was because there was nobody who could do some selecting and sorting out and say, for you, Vijay Bhatt, this is the right thing. There's nobody. And this is also the reason why we chose to write the book. We said, look, if we have done all this research for 10 years, <coughs> excuse me, why should we expect other people to do the same? Why can't we put our insight and make it available for people in a book so that they can make quicker, better decisions. <coughs> Excuse me. Taking responsibility also says one other very important thing, which is that as I deconstructed and myself and reconstructed, do you think everything was pretty? Can't be. I had to go down to the deepest and darkest places of myself and accept them as part of me. This is not something that we are conditioned or trained or encouraged to do. And I believe that that is extremely important for leaders. That you understand those blind spots, that dark side, the things that trigger you, the things where you have a disproportionate reaction, your flashpoints in a way. And so, <coughs> reflection number four. All of us, all of you, have some innate gifts and talents. What are they? But equally, all of us, all of you, have a dark side. What is it made up of? What is it that triggers you to be extremely angry sometimes? Or extremely worried or anxious sometimes? Or extremely fearful sometimes? Or extremely sad sometimes? extremely resentful sometimes, extremely guilty sometimes. What is it? What is that stuff that's sitting there that remains unexamined until it leaks out into your subconscious, from the subconscious into the conscious and people say, oh, what happened to this person? He was okay just a few minutes ago.
being authentic means also being whole, accepting the noble sides of me and accepting the shadow sides of me. And feeling responsible and feeling okay with every part of me, noble or depraved. Is the writing flow getting a little better? I know the questions are getting harder. Yeah. Over time, as Rajiv explained it so beautifully, as I was changing and this reconstruction was taking place, slowly this new life purpose also began to take shape. You know, individuals started to come to us and say, oh, Abhi heard that you've had cancer, so and so in my family has cancer, would you please talk to the person and tell them that it's possible to survive and grow that person's taking it very badly. So one person, then a few people, then we started running some little groups in our home. This was in Hong Kong. Then somebody gave us the chance and said, can you come to an interfaith meeting and please talk about what you've done with cancer? It got bigger, 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 bigger. And then we decided to, after we went back to India, we decided to run a retreat. A seven day intensive, therapeutic retreat. And for the first time, we kind of said, oh my God, this is when we are in full flow. This is our purpose. This is what we really want to be able to do. You know, the cancer statistics are just deadly. One in three people in the Western world are going to get cancer. One in three. In some countries, it's already up to 40%. And there is no answer on the horizon just yet. In fact, it's a very mysterious disease. So anything that we can do to mitigate that, to address that, we believe is worth it. So this is how the new life purpose started to take shape. And that leads me to reflection number five. <clears throat> it's kind of the peak of the bell curve for leaders. What is your life purpose? What is the legacy you want to leave behind? Earlier today, Rajiv outlined some of the possible steps that you could take to getting to that life purpose, after which work stops being work. As we started delving into this field of cancer, we noticed that the language that is used in cancer is extremely negative, in fact, defeatist. Cancer is described as the internal terrorist, the scourge of mankind. You know, this kind of, we've turned cancer into this implacable enemy against whom all of mankind is in battle and we are currently losing and we are all bloodied and sweaty and dusty kind of feeling. Right? This is the language that we use. Fight it, battle it, overcome it. This is our language. And I was doing some study, somebody mentioned NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And I was starting to see that language and mindset have a close connection. <clears throat> the second thing I noticed was that people were throwing stats at me when I started talking about cancer recovery. Oh, one in three people this, 
pancreatic cancer average time is within four months and two years and you know lots of statistics but if you sift through the statistics there are some nuggets there are some rare folks who in relative terms are very small in number but in absolute terms there are thousands of people around the world who have faced cancer and who have come out of it successfully I call them the anecdotes okay because most clinical scientific people dismiss it as anecdotal not scientific well I don't care they help me thousands of people like that anecdotes and so in my view I don't want to be a statistic statistics die on schedule somebody was mentioning this earlier right I want to be an anecdote I don't want to be a survivor survivor makes me feel as if I'm in a choppy sea I'm somehow treading water and the next wave will come and whoosh dunk me again I don't want to be a survivor I want to be a thriver I want to be somebody who has become a better person and can spread a much more positive message in the world I really don't like being called a cancer patient it's got this sense of you know somebody lying passively in a hospital bed I'm a cancer impatient I want to get past this I want to okay fine you know I want to grow from this experience so the question is what will it take for our language to change what will it take for our mindset to change what will it take for our conversations around cancer to change our internal relationship with it will have to change first without that none of this is going to be possible so reflection number six as leaders and uh, Rajiv I think mentioned this earlier all of us have self-talk you know that harsh voice in the head that tells you nah 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 you can't do that really you're going to try that you're bound to fail right so what is the self-talk the inner critic is the technical phrase for it what is your inner critic telling you as a leader that no well, things are tough and so we might just about be able to make 18 percent but don't commit 18 percent because commit 15 and then you know under promise and over deliver and all this stuff what is that self-talk what do you need to let go of that is disabling and limiting and instead what are those enablers that you want to embed instead realistic ones mind you not Superman stuff X-Men stuff realistic stuff that you as a leader can truly feel stretched by challenged by but it's in the reach it's in the realm of possibility what do you need to do pick one that you want to let go today and whenever that little inner critic on your left shoulder says that tell him stop So what do the thrivers and impatience and anecdotes do? I talked about these thousands of people. If you really look at it and you study it carefully, they do five things. Underneath is this basic attitude that they are not 
fighting their cancer, they are in fact honoring it and transcending it. But what do they specifically do? They reclaim their power. When you're, a, when you're struck by cancer in the early days, you're so vulnerable, so fragile, that everybody else has the power. Your family has the power, the priest has the power, the doctor has the power, everybody has power over you, and in the early days, it's okay. But I have seen people with cancer who don't reclaim their power for years. They've given it away. So number one, they reclaim their power. Number two, they don't see cancer as a bump in the road. Now, in Malaysia, this may not ring a bell. I can tell you in India, it rings a bell. We have many bumps in the road, many potholes, right? But these thrivers look at cancer as a fork in the road, a new direction. Their life shifts. Number three, they learn to access their deeper resources, and perhaps this is one of the most important things that they do. They don't rely only on the external resources. They start to find a source of energy within themselves that is inexhaustible. We'll talk a little bit more about this. Four, they stop worrying about quantity of life. They totally ignore all this prognosis about four months and six months and stuff, they just ignore it. And they say, in whatever time I have, what is the highest quality life I can lead? And interestingly, almost magically, when you focus on the quality of life, it seems there's good evidence now to show that the, quality, the quantity of light might also increase. And finally, five, they turn their experience to serve others. We heard about volunteering, gifting, all of that. Well, I look at it much more directly. Helping others is part of my own healing. This is what thrivers and anecdotes do. <clears throat> So, reflection for you, when you find yourself in change and transition, how open and adaptive are you? And how do you access your inner resources? What do you do? Couple of drinks in the bar. What do you do? So I want to very quickly zip through, I know that time is of the essence, I want to very quickly zip through this part, which is our approach. It actually starts with a very simple question. While the doctors are treating the disease, who is healing the person? We believe that somebody needs to focus on healing the whole person while the doctors are treating the disease. The doctors don't have the time. They don't have the bandwidth. They may or may not even have the interest. Perhaps they're not even trained for it. This is very important according to us. The science on which this is based is the stress, immunity, illness axis. Stress compromises immunity, compromised immunity leads to illness, and the science behind it is called psychoneuroimmunology, PNI. Our, neurology, our psychology, how we think, affects the neurology, nervous system affects the immunology, the endocrine system. That's how it works. Good research on this. Stress, by the way, isn't a time problem, it's an energy problem. And I'm sure you've seen this in Malaysia, we certainly see it in India.
And this is the important part that according to our work and our approach, stress is multidimensional and therefore we need to deal with it at all these five levels. Physical, mental, emotional, systemic, and spiritual. Physical, mental, emotional, systemic, and spiritual. Now when I look at my own analysis on this, and I think back to my life before cancer, my physical stressors were very high. I was traveling too much, not eating the right things, not exercising enough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mental stressors were okay. Emotional stressors were quite poor. <clears throat> Reactivity, having snap judgments, and things like that. Systemic stressors were okay. Spiritual stressors, I was very much in that crisis mode. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? I come from a very spiritually oriented family, but I had personally lost touch with spirit. And so therefore my reconstruction was focused on these three elements. Physical, emotional, spiritual. This is how we approach it for myself. I did it for myself and we approach it with others as well. So we've talked about sources of energy and from our work, we think that there are three sources of energy. The first is the body, the food we eat, the way we keep our physicality in shape. But the body is like a battery. It has a certain charge and then it winds down and then it needs to be recharged again. The second is to look at the generator, the mind, what we heard today. The mind can have a great impact on the body. It can rev us up, it can slow us down, it can do many things. But perhaps the most important one from our perspective is to be connected to the grid. I'm not talking about putting your fingers into a plug point. I'm talking about being connected to the grid of prana, chi, whatever you want to call it, inexhaustible. That's continuously just, whoa. And this requires some contemplative or spiritual practice of some kind. So, reflection number eight. How do you manage your stressors? Where do you source your energy from? From the battery? From the generator? From the grid? Essentially, we offer a holistic and integrated approach. Holistic means addressing all aspects of the person. We talked about this earlier, physical, emotional, mental, systemic, spiritual. And integrated means drawing upon different systems. It could be Western, Indian, Chinese, mind, body, energy, etc., etc., etc. And the trick is to combine and tailor it for each individual. There is no formula. There's no formula. Because each person is different. What are the outputs from this approach? We've been blessed. We do one-on-one -on -one cancer coaching. We are in the process of now certifying cancer coaches. We conduct residential retreats. We have created an online diagnostic tool that actually tells you what your illness risk is likely to be based on an analysis of the stressors. We run a blog. We have a YouTube channel. We have a monthly newsletter. It reaches about 15,000 people. We've written a book. We get fantastic media coverage. We must be doing something right. Just showing you a few examples. 
Media has even come forward and said, we'll give you some free advertising space. So we've run a few ads, which says cancer will change your life, maybe for the better. Your best chance with cancer is to stop fighting it, and so on. So last point is gratitude. And if I look back on these 13 years, there is just absolutely no way that I could have done this alone. Just no way. Nilima was totally with me. I would say she saved my life. But there have been zillions of other people. Supporters, friends, relatives. And perhaps the people who still keep us grounded are the people with cancer that we work with. I don't know how many of you have had this experience. When somebody dies in your arms, completely changes you. Completely changes you. So I'm filled with gratitude for all those people and for you for patiently listening. Reflection number nine, what are you truly grateful for? Nipun asked this question yesterday as well. And how do you express it? So the last point uh, I want to make, I want to show you a three minute film which is about honoring cancer and honoring life. It's based on the idea that no one is your friend, no one your enemy, all alike are your teachers. But before I show you the film, I want to give you reflection number 10, last one. And perhaps it's the culmination of what I've been saying. Adversity is a worthy adversary. Adversity is a worthy adversary. So as a leader, how do you show grace under fire? And I'm not just talking about not giving up. I know we've heard the not giving up, persisting, staying the course, etc. I'm talking about grace under fire which is really bringing our highest self, our noblest self, into the trenches. How do you do that? What do you do? You're all senior leaders. I'm sure you've been faced with adversity, and I'm sure you've demonstrated grace under fire. What is that quality? What do you bring? So can we show the film, please? Of course, a crab is a strange pet to have. Unless, well, if you're a mermaid, which I'm not, or if you're a cancer thriver, which I am. Think about it. One minute, he's harmless, even docile. And then suddenly, he'll snap at the hand that feeds him. Quite like the disease itself, you know. You never really know when the next bite's coming. And that's why I brought this guy home. Cancer is his name, and he's more than my pet. He reminds me that I once had cancer, and that experience changed me forever. More than the surgery, what really hurt was the truth. It wasn't fate that gave me the cancer. I gave it to myself with the life choices I made. So, to be cancer free, what I had to do was to make better life choices. That's where this guy comes in. Be healthy Vijay, he says, and be whole. Most importantly, he's my pet and I'm in charge of him. 
not the other way around. I like to describe cancer as a scaregiver because it did threaten my life. But it was no match at all for Nilima, my caregiver. Now together, they keep me focused and positive. People call me a survivor. But I don't like that very much. Look at me. I'm no survivor. I'm a thriver. I've been cancer-free for 11 years. And through it all, we've been co-travelers. To tame your cancer, you have to see it differently. Remember, how you feel is how you heal. So get past your fear of death and learn to respect your cancer experience. That's when you too can stop surviving and start thriving. I used to look at a crab and see hot, spicy crab soup. Now I look at him and I see a new life ahead of me. My last slide, please. So, that's the name of my company. I just want to say, may your roots burrow deep. May your wings take you high. Thank you very much.